All right, Jamie Beeman, round two. Shall we do it? <laughs> Let's do it, honey. Many more to come. Uh, I'm hoping so. Look, we're, we're both in the arts. We're both in the arts industry. We work in the arts and we've both had some negative experiences with people telling us what we can and can't say. What, what is that about? What is that about for you? You can't say this. Um, well, unfortunately, now I'm educated. I think, I think many, many people who are encountering certain ideological things, especially in the workplace, um, they're not really super, super educated. And, in my, and, and that doesn't mean they're ignorant. It, it means that they're not following the patterning of certain ideological uh, 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 mechanisms that are at work and they don't know where they come from and they're just trying to keep their head down and and not run afoul of anything and they want to be a good person but they just don't want to and they also may not uh, my experience has been people who have not been kind of bullied by some of this stuff don't believe that you can be and i i try to turn them on to some some people who have been who are more important than me. Like I was watching today a, a live stream a conversation between Peter Bogosian, who's somebody I follow. I don't agree 100% with everything uh, uh, about it, but I think he's trying to get people talking. And I, I'm in favor of that. And he had an interesting conversation with, with Tabia Lee. And I don't know if you know Tabia Lee. Uh, you may have encountered her. She's, she's somewhat affiliated with FAIR, but she, and she talked about FAIR. Uh, but she's this African American woman who was the dean of equity or whatever, inclusion or whatever it is at some school. And she came in with a particular idea of what that was. And she was immediately attacked by people who were telling her that she was not doing it right and that she shouldn't center whiteness. And like she tried to do like a group on campus at this particular school that celebrated different uh, uh, ethnic and racial groups and religious groups holidays and make sure that people are included and celebrated. And she was announcing something about the, uh, Jewish holiday, high holidays or something. And they literally said to her, Jewish people are white oppressors and we do not center Jewish people. Ooh. And she's like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, she of all people, uh, coming up against some uh, people tell, telling you she's a white supremacist. Even though she's black. She's a black woman. And she's a black woman who works in like these areas of inclusion and, and community and, 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 and intersectionality and racial sensitivity. Uh, but it is very much about silencing dissent. And if you are white and male and, my age and, and, at, and particularly if you have a particular education level, uh, or authority level in your field, that kind of thing, they want you to be silent and they want you to be quite visibly so. It just seems like they're elevating one group at the expense of another. Like, why not just elevate, elevate both instead of, yeah, you, to, to lift one group up, it's like you have to bring down another group, right? Well, I think that's at the core of the concept of equity, and that is to take the the people who've had all the power, who've had all of the – who have structured the society and bring them down and bring up marginalized populations. That's the whole idea is to sort of unseat white-centered – but it's just it's society. Such, it's such an oversimplification, isn't it? Because it doesn't it doesn't take into consideration all these other factors, like socioeconomic factors. I've talked about this before. Like there are there are different abilities and privileges that we have, and it sort of just assumes that every non-white person has it worse than every white person, or every man has it better than every woman, or every straight person has it better than every gay person. But I'm just, <laughs> why are we why are we oversimplifying things in this way? Do you think? You know, I wish I understood it. I really wish I understood why people think that this is okay. Uh, but clearly, there are well-meaning people, passionate, committed people in this area who feel like they're doing the right thing. I personally, if I'm going to, if I'm going to be subjected to a, a project in which I need to 
examine my privilege or whatever it is, then I need to be, I need to know going in what it is I'm going to do. And I need to agree to it. This is America. If it's part of your training for your job and, and we are seeing a real, uh, uh, in corporate American stuff, uh, uh, corporate America, uh, in particular on this whole DEI thing of, you know, people, people get rewarded. I forget what it's called, your F, FSG or score or something. I forget what it's called, but businesses get points if they, offer these kinds of trainings, these sensitivity training, diversity training, and they, they get points. Uh, and it, it, and it must be in some way beneficial to business. But I think what's happening is people are getting tired of the dissension and the, and the bullying and the, it, it, it's not altruistic. <laughs> and frankly, I have a therapist and I also believe in treating, I, treating everybody with, with kindness and with courtesy. Courtesy is gone. Partially I blame Trump because Trump is like, doesn't give a crap about how rude he is or doesn't treat anybody well ever. And he got elected. And when he did his big first big debate with the big field of the Republican, uh, you know, whoever was trying to be president, he was so nasty to people and so entertainingly, like, didn't give a crap. I turned to my friend who was sitting with me, both of us, you know, horrified by the prospect. And he was like, oh, God, he's so ridiculous. They'll never happen. I said, what he's doing right here, that's going to get him elected. He doesn't give a crap. He doesn't care. And he's mean. And I, and entertainingly so. And I don't know what if that is in human nature. I, I don't know, uh, that people are attracted to that kind of, uh, that kind of, I don't know, audacity, not audacity. I don't know. He's kind of anarchic. He kind of, but what happened is there's an erosion, right? So I find oftentimes when young people are talking, very passionately about respecting people's preferred pronoun, respecting their this. I what I think they mean is courtesy. I feel like I I don't care if people think I'm a good person or not because I am a good person in my own estimation, and in, and I have loved ones who who will back me up, good people that I love. Uh, but I also have a core. I know who I am. Um, but I see, I, I think they're confusing something. I think people want respect for something, which is different than me saying, oh, you want to be called? Oh, thank you. Yes, I will certainly honor that. And I want you to feel like, like I'm polite and that I'm a, a good person. But I, but respect is something else to me. I don't know. Do you think so? I'm just, I'm, Touching on what you say about the pronouns, it, it is interesting because, yeah, it is a sign mm. of respect to use people's pronouns and it's, but it seems to be like it's this verbal thing where I'm more interested in, okay, well, how, how do you treat me? Like, do you, do you listen to me? Are you kind to me? Do you, you know, do you shut me down? Do you like, what, what are the, um, these internal qualities that you're using to sort of present yourself as a, as a good person? But quite often, pronouns it's like these are my pronouns but inside then they're not kind or they're not generous or gracious to other people so it seems to be like this outward presentation of oh i'm a good respecting person but that they, they don't behave the behavior says something different so much of it is performative and as performers as actors i think we can see that and i think a lot of times it's difficult in the theater workspace, especially in, in, in between performers to confront this because it's sort of like, what are you, do what are you, what are you doing? Like we can tell when something is being sort of pushed and there is a performative aspect to it. You know, uh, I just finished doing this show, uh, the musical Oliver playing Fagin, which is just such a fun part. And I had to have around me throughout my performance, 20 kids that, 
I had to kind of be the leader of these kids because it's that's the story. And, you know, I said ahead of time to my director, because he's the head of education at this theater, and he's a wonderful man, and he's trained some fabulous kids. They're a great group of kids. But I said to him, I said, I want you to know ahead of time that I don't do pronouns. And he went, and I said, I will respect everyone else's pronouns. I will I will absolutely whatever, especially the children, I want them to feel happy and safe and welcome and all those things. But I will not offer mine because that's not what I'm about. And this is America. And he went, oh. And I said, well, if a kid, if a 10-year-old in the company on day one, because there's always that circle up where everybody says their things, you know. And if a little kid goes, hey, you forgot your pronouns, I'll give my pronouns. But... If you don't have the choice, if it's enforced that you define yourself in a particular way, that's different than honoring somebody else. And I, and I, I no longer uh, uh, invest in this thing of, well, we all give our pronouns so that the people who are non-binary, who are trans or whatever, feel safe to give theirs. And my point of view with that is, we're past that now. We're so used to this practice and so ubiquitous. Uh, that how can they no longer feel safe? Everyone's doing it, you know? Uh, so to me, it's like... Yeah, it's interesting because it just reminds me... What do you think? It reminds me of going to church, right? You go to, you, Or you go to church or you go to someone's house for dinner and you say, if they're religious, you say a prayer, right? It's respectful, but it's kind of, we've known that about religion. So it's like, if you're not religious, you don't go to church, right? But in the theatre community, it's like we've always been there and it's this new introduction of this idea that we sort of didn't agree, we don't agree on or we didn't, yeah, it's, it's, it's different, right? It's religious, but it's, it's different. Well, it was weird to encounter it a year ago when I did encounter it. This last experience I had was the polar opposite to, to this encounter I had with this kind of really nasty bullying kind of energy. This was the opposite. And in fact, what I loved, and this, you can steal this because I still, I'm going to, I'm carrying it onward. Uh, my director out on this show, he, his term was not safe space. His term was brave space. We're going to create a brave space where everybody is going to be brave enough to join in the communal creation of this. And everybody is going to have to work with other people and connect with other people. And that's a brave thing to do. And we're all going to do that together. It was a unifying thing, which I loved. I loved that. And there were no, there were no, they, them, or, or alternative pronoun kids in the show or any, really anybody performing in the show. A lot of those folks were people who worked, uh, on crew, um, uh, very wonderful, creative, lovely group of, of people. Um, and a couple of them were tr considered themselves trans. And, and what was interesting about it was, uh, they, I don't know if you've had this experience, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but my heart goes out because particularly uh, what uh, young uh, biological women who who don't – are struggling with the masculine part of themselves, they're not sure if uh, if they're male or female or what they are, and I, my heart goes out to that because I think they want validation. They don't want false validation. They want people to see them as they are. And what's interesting about it was there were a couple of young people on the crew, and they're those 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 young, born a woman, uh, kind of kind of masculine. They're crew people, right? They're theater crew people. Um, but they were drawn to me. And, and wanted to be around me and wanted to engage me in conversation because they could tell, I think innately that I've walked, I've walked some miles in the world and in the business and I'm very openly gay. And I think they felt like I don't want all of these things in front of me, but I don't know how to go around the, the rituals and the verbiage and stuff. And I just want to connect with you. And they would, 
And it was so sweet, but it was also so tentative. And I think I want people to feel good about themselves, but you can't. And I say this as an actor because we're addicted to external validation. However, this is the core problem with all of this pronoun shit is you're asking other people to validate you yeah. where you don't feel confident in it. If you did, you wouldn't need it. It wouldn't matter. It's the worst thing for self-acceptance. Um, but it's beautiful what you're saying about because yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I want to be that kind presence to people. And I, I really believe in encouraging people. And it's unfortunate that I feel like people see me as someone who doesn't accept them just because I don't agree with the idea. The idea is linked to the person. And it's just like, ah, oh, I, I want to be encouraging and create space for people. But if we don't politically align, you're seen as an outsider or someone who's horrible or just doesn't accept you. And it's just, it's so unfortunate. And I don't know what to do. Should I just bend over and just say, use the fucking pronoun? No. Here's what I'm going to say. There's a time and a place for everything. This is the other thing that is gone. From, I mean, I'm not Australian, but I, t I suspect it's, it's similar there as it is here. Uh, uh, propriety is no longer a thing. It may be considered some sort of, I don't know, white colonialist patriarchal thing, but there's a time and a place for everything. Okay. If we're here on somebody else's dime to create a theater piece and to rehearse and work together. And we've just met and we're going to get into this intense process and we've only got a certain amount of time and all that stuff to impose a lot of political ideo ideological uh, practices into that, unless the show is about that and we're exploring that because I've been in one of those rooms, one of those spaces. Uh, that's an imposition. That's it's like school prayer. It's always been this big bugaboo in America about school prayer and how we're not going to do school prayer because not every kid in the room is going to be that faith or that background. And that's not right. And we stop giving the uh, kids stop doing the the uh, we used to pledge allegiance to the flag. Every morning it was a ritual. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America with a hand on our heart. Uh, so I gave a, an example, and this may be a, a wrong example, although you and I both seem to be in agreement that there is a religious element to some of the more, more intense uh, imposition of, of ideology. There is a religious quality to it where I'm telling you you're this, your unconscious bias, you're, you don't even know what you, I know. You know, there's something very kind of like, zealous about that and to me okay if you're going to do that then what if, if we all have to say our pronouns what if there's a member of a company or member of a group of people you're working with a work group who is muslim and she wears a hijab and she's the only one in the group wearing the hijab are we all going to on the first day wear a hijab in our circle up to make her feel safe that to me sounds like it would, might be insulting and pointing out something that's already clear. And I wonder, what, is that an apt <laughs> comparison or am I being? No, no, it's good. But what you're saying, I'm stuck on. Yeah, you're, we're imposing ideology on people. That's it. Like when you're, I mean, the LGBT movement was good, right? We need, we needed acceptance. And I mean, the conservative argument was you're imposing your lifestyle on me. But if we look at that objectively, we're not. We just want to. Ex we just wanted to exist with everyone else, but yeah. Well, and this is something that that gay men, particularly of my age, are are voicing. Like Andrew Sullivan, who I follow and I find to be very much on the same page with me. He's like, we did all of this work and all this activism in the eighties and nineties, and push for marriage equality, all this stuff, all the while saying to the majority people. We don't want to take anything away from you. We don't want to take any anything from you. We just want to live our lives. We want to have homes and partners and we want to do our work and 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 love the people we love. And we're not trying to make you do anything that you don't feel right about. And that was persuasive, clearly was persuasive. 
Um, and it's something called tolerance. That's another word that you don't hear much anymore. Tolerance, where the only way that minorities in America have really made the strides that they have has been through a persuasive uh, 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 approach to the majority, demystifying things, taking away old uh, uh, tropes and 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 stereotypes and and false ideas about people, and you know. This is the truest thing that there is. I, I forget who it was. A very famous person made a, a quote about the cure for racism is travel. <laughs> you have to encounter people who are different than you. Not just in your own space, but in their world. And be open to the idea that humans are humans and most humans really are not trying to do anything to other humans that they wouldn't have done to them. And I, so I don't know. I don't know, but I do know that the answer to your previous question is this. How do you do that and not bend over, blah, blah. You have to say what what limits you have. Like when I said, you know, I, I'm not going to offer my pronouns. I'm not making a big thing out of it. I'm just not going to do that because until somebody passes a law that says I have to do that, I'm not going to do that. I don't live in Canada, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's possible to respect other people. And it's even possible to sort of massage yourself into a, a, a current cultural moment without sacrificing your own sense of who you are. And you, all you need to be, Melody, is empathetic and kind and listen to people and, and just be, people know when you're you can detect people's behavior right? right you can you can tell when someone's posturing and you you can tell when someone's being kind that is true it's how you treat people not what you say right that's right that's right and i think some of the more combative more confrontive uh people who have a certain kind of an ideology the reason they're as angry as they are is that they know when somebody smells the insincerity and smells the manipulation and they, and it bothers them, it makes them mad. So they double down. Uh, and children are super interesting. I was talking uh, on my podcast with, with uh, Gabriel uh, uh, Brown and her fiance about working with these children for, for five weeks, these, these wonderful little theater kids, quite a, a diverse group of kids, but you know, different ages, 11, 12, 13, impressionable age. Those kids don't miss anything. They don't miss an eye roll. They don't miss a gesture. They're constantly watching older people, what you're doing. They're, they're so present and they smell fake. They smell it. They know when something's like, that doesn't, mm -mm. they haven't yet had that knocked out of them, that intuition. And kids, my, my experience with the kids was they want to be like me, just like I wanted to be like the older actors that I was around when I was a young kid wanting to be a star. They, they want to know what you know. There were two little boys in the show, uh, who were the kind of more awkward of the two. It's interesting to be around girls and boys, uh, who are around 11, 12, 13, because the girls are way ahead. <laughs> They're way ahead. They're much more sort of confident. They know who they are. They're cool. And the boys are kind of like almost not quite there because their hormones are bouncing around, whatever. But there were these two boys in the show. And I, 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 you know, I would say hello to them early on and stuff like that. They seemed a little shy. By the time we moved into the theater and started our technical process, we were doing note sessions and they would sit next to me. They'd look for me. And we'd be taking notes from the director and they'd sit with me with their little, like I had my pad and pencil and they're like this. And they were my little sidekicks. They, they wanted to learn from me. And it's not just what you say, it's who you're being in the space. And to me, that's the example. The, they pick up on the emotional cues they feel safe when somebody is really present and really open 
and interested in them, curious about them, you know, and I think that that's something that we're missing here. And I, and I empathize with people who want to be, who, they're trying something on. So this is the part of me that is very empathetic to the whole gender exploration. Do it. You're, it's new. You're exploring it. You're trying to find it. You're trying to figure it out and it, it's going to change and it may change. And if you're 20 and you're a boy, a, a biological boy and you're wearing a dress and you're trying it on, you're wearing nail polish and you're being with your friends and you're all trying to, we all had a version of that, but be open to the idea that it's not going to be forever and unfortunately the ideology says we must tell everybody that this is the way it is and if you say no you must be destroyed that's the issue that's the issue jamie like i'm i'm all for gender yeah. nonconformity. yeah like i'm like hairy leg lesbian like i wear boys clothes but it's <laughs> the imposition of pronouns you have to call me this not i get to be this way like be yourself, but when you start to say, but for me to be myself, you need to call me this. That that's the issue that everyone's having. No one has an issue with gender nonconformity. Gender nonconformity is a great thing, but it's we need to see it as a variation of our biological sex. Mm -hmm. I think it's all fruit of the poisonous tree. I think unfortunately we're in this social justice time where the 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 tenets of a very very militant uh, racial movement around anti-racism uh, uh, and the and the principles of 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 decentering white heteronormative society um, they're trying to apply the same tactics and the same ideas the same absolutes because we've all heard this if you're white you were born a racist and you'll never not be a racist you know what I mean yeah, yeah. And I think that the gender thing and I think the 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 trans thing and the gay and the lesbian, all that, that it is such it's so much more interesting than the 55 flags and the 100 gender things and the neo pronouns. It's a way of being. It's not. I wrote a whole thing about the septum piercing as because it's so ubiquitous amongst certain types of young people. Uh They've created a new stereotype. They all have the pink hair or the blue hair and the theft piercing and the, and the clown makeup. And they think they're being radical, but they're so conformist. It's odd to me because it's like punks. When I was in school in the 80s, you know, uh, punk was happening. But like if somebody came in onto the subway with like a mohawk and like a septum piercing and a, you were like, whoa. And they were like, yeah. What are you going to do about it? You know, it was so radical. Now we've got a whole population of young people who are all dressed the same radical way. So it's no longer radical. <laughs> and they can't, somehow can't see that. It's so conformist. It's so like, here's my tribe and y'all are mean. And we're going to do a TikTok video and tell you how to talk to people who are trans. It's, yeah. I don't know. I've been an out gay man <laughs> since the 80s. I have trans friends who would never, who've been friends in my life for years. I, the idea that they ever would have come up to me and gone, you, you have to talk to me like, blah, blah, blah. what? No. <laughs> I don't know. I, but I worry about the way it's, I don't worry about that part of it, the cultural part of it, the interpersonal discomfort of it, or the activism. I don't, whatever. I'm worried about the institutionalization in government, in universities, in every level of society, that it's being either explicitly or implicitly legislated that these things must be, right? No one got a vote. <laughs> no, like, let's put this up to a referendum. It's bureaucracy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, it's really, right. yeah. Right, right. I mean, I'm, uh, you, if we go back to what I was saying about, you know, the, the imposition of ideologies on people in the arts communities, I'm wondering, I'm having an issue with land acknowledgements, right? We've got to play a land acknowledgement before a show that I'm doing. And I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything to help Indigenous people 
So isn't playing a land acknowledgement just like lip service? But then someone else said, well, it's probably the least you could do. But then I'm like, yeah, but how is that helping? How does it, acknowledging the land that I'm on help anyone? Like, what? what? And we're, we're all just going along with it. And I feel like an idiot for um, pushing back on it. And the, I'm, I'm fucking white. So maybe I should just shut the fuck up and not say anything. Well, did they offer anything besides well it's just it's just the right thing to do or or what's wrong why not do that because you hear that a lot it's like well what's what's wrong with doing that why do you object to that you know and it's like because it doesn't mean anything it i mean in america i don't know what it's like over there you have a huge indigenous population and there's a history there of colonial you've got your own version of that but here We've been paying lip service to First Nations people here forever. <laughs> you know, they, they, people, the people who need things are not getting them. And saying before, like Actors Equity Association, which I'm quite critical of, but it's my parent union. I've been a member for 33 years. I, I believe in the union. I believe in my industry and what the union has done for me personally. Uh, but this stuff, new stuff, it seems to forget a lot of the history that our union had. Our union broke down a lot of barriers, right? So then these land acknowledgements happened. So I did like a member, they did a virtual member meeting. Uh, you know, they do them like twice a year. And I, you, I went on the call and it's leadership from different committees, you know, talking about how, what kind of, per, giving a report, basically. And the co-host of the meetings was this African-American member who was head of a particular area of the whatever. And it, before she said anything, she said, I'm speaking to you from Manhattan. Manhattan was uh, the, the land of the such and such tribe. And, da -da -da, and she rattled it off. Like it was blah, 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 like a, that. And I went, okay. And, and my take on it is this. I agree with your friend. If you're going to come out before a show and do a curtain speech and give a land acknowledgement and say, on this land used to be inhabited by these people and it's not anymore. If all you want to do is to, make all the white people in the audience aware that they're that at some point in history white people did a terrible thing and that's that those are your patrons they bought a ticket they want to see 42nd street and you're going to come out and say this thing and then enjoy the show to me it pass a hat <laughs> i mean Announce that you're doing a new play development series about Native people by, you know, Native American writers, or you're offering a, 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 a workshop with this Native American theater creator about the culture and it's available to you and then take some of the proceeds from that and put it towards, uh, 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 programs that, that lift up young Native American people who might want to be in, involved in theater. It's just, to me, it's, there's a lot of, act, I, I get annoyed by hypocrisy and tone deafness. It bothers me. So I, you don't have this over there, but you know that over here we have this acronym now, BIPOC, right? Black Indigenous People of Color. You got BIPOC? Okay. Uh, they don't have it in England. I know they don't have it in England because they don't have that indigenous part of it. Okay. But what it clearly is, is a hierarchy of the oppressed with black people at the top. And then it's indigenous. And then it's everybody else who's not white. And if indigenous is second, why am I not seeing lots of Native American plays and new musicals? And why aren't I seeing Native American stars of Disney Plus series? What? If you're, because I'm seeing a lot of, of, of visibility, representation, diversity, uh, of, of, of African American people, black people. Uh, if they're number two, 
what why am I not seeing this? And I know that like in Actors Equity, their last report on di- on the ethnic right racial makeup of the union, there were 79 members of the union nationwide who identified as Native American. 79 as a pair, as as opposed to like I don't know, like eight percent of of the union is African American. So it's like thousands. Aren't those people shouldn't we should hire all seventy nine of those people if we're about that? Like let's just give them a job. But the land acknowledgement thing to me is part and parcel of an attitude towards uh, Native American people in this country uh, that I find. I find it uh, 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 belittling and 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 regressive, and and I don't know. And I, I've tried to get conversations with people who who have that ethnic background, that racial background, who are who are descended from Native Native American tribes, uh, to talk to me about it. Um, and the people I have spoken to have been like, "Yeah, it doesn't really mean anything." And really, what they want to talk about is how. There's so much conflict in that community between uh, people who are legitimately descended from or who legitimately have that racial heritage and what they call pretendians. People who are sort of posing as, I don't know if you remember the, uh, not too long ago, Sashin Littlefeather passed away. And you may not know this because it's, it's, it's long ago, but when Marlon Brando won the Oscar for the movie The Godfather, he, instead of coming to the Oscars, he sent a Native American woman named Sashin Littlefeather out to accept his Oscar in his place to protest the treatment of Native people. And she was booed by the audience. John Wayne had to be restrained from rushing the stage. (laughs) It was very controversial, and it certainly wasn't the kind of Hollywood we have today. People were like, this is bullshit, you know. And she passed away not too long ago, and there's a lot of controversy now about whether or not she was really Native American or not. Her family is saying no. <laughs> I think it's her family. But people are like, she wasn't even actually a Native American person. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Certainly looked it, but she was also in, a, in, you know, in an outfit. But the, that's not even the point. The point is why, if you're, if you're saying to us, this is, this is the hierarchy if you're saying this is how we have to prioritize people, the, the the black population, they were enslaved. They were brought here by no purpose of their own. The Native American people were slaughtered and marginalized and their lands were taken by the class. If that's the next level that we need to address, a land acknowledgement to me seems like too little and and it's, it does feel like lip service to me. I find it very condescending. And it's like declaring your pronouns. It's like, if we want to do this, like, if theaters want to operate, we have to have this land acknowledgement announcement. It's just part of the ritual. Let's just let's just say it. Lip service, it's easier than actually doing anything. And it makes you appear good, right? It makes you appear like you're a good person. Um, but I'm undecided, I think. The main thing is to just question this stuff, right, and have a conversation around it. Um, and I suppose that brings me to Yeah, and I want to hear from Indigenous people. I want to hear from Indigenous people, especially in our industry. I want to hear what they feel about it, because if it's being done at their behest, then then what you and I think about it doesn't really matter as much, especially in the eyes of people who are saying you're not entitled to have an opinion about some another race, yeah. you know, that thing. Um, well, but, but I, I find people are quite quiet do, about it. To do something, I think. You're I not think being should... asked. That's the problem. You're no, not I, being asked. No, I am being asked. I am being asked to do a land acknowledge. No, yeah, if I'm being asked to do a land acknowledgement, I want to question why. That was my point. Do you have to do one? Before been, your show been, that quote, you're about unquote, to do? requested, but not required. So there's a difference in word there. But I'm just like, oh, my show is about questioning the imposition of ideology. So I'm mm. questioning this. 
right? Mm. Mm. So I wonder if you have the autonomy uh, of, of how you're going to do the land acknowledgement. And if you want to be creative about that, see, if I were in your shoes and I were in a festival or something and, and I was doing my show and they said, we were, we suggest, we think you should think about this land acknowledgement thing. I would combine it with a fundraiser. <laughs> I'd pass the hat. Okay. I'd put my money where my mouth is. I would, I'd be like, Da, 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 land acknowledgement. And on your way out, I will be standing with a bucket taking up uh, donations for this indigenous person's organization. And you don't have to f- force it. You don't have to make a thing out of it. But by doing that, you might actually get people thinking about what the efficacy is of that practice. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, agree. I don't know, but I, no, I agree. But I think it's also con- probably controversial to say this, but I just, I honestly, oh, no, I'm not going to say it, but that I think to me, what? that would be pretending like I care. Like you, I, I just, I would want to feel it in my heart that I actually care. And I just, I don't think I have yeah, enough time absolutely. at the minute. Like I don't. People posture like they genuinely care about 10 different social justice issues. And I'm just like, what do I actually care about? I, don't, I think I don't want to pretend. That's my issue. Mm. I don't want to be a pretender. And I think it, it has to I be. I agree with you. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to me, it's like thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Talk is cheap. Hashtags are cheap. You know, listing on your bio on TikTok, you know, that you're against this and for that and blah, blah, blah. Talk is cheap. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell you a quick little story uh, that I think is relevant because I grew up Jewish uh, in an interfaith household. My father wasn't Jewish. My mother was first generation American. Her parents were from Eastern Europe. And she taught at our Hebrew school. Uh, uh, and she taught drama and she ran the temple youth group. And then she started teaching the, um, uh, confirmation class. And this was the kids that were like high school aged, about to graduate, go out in the world. It was about adulthood as how to live as a, a Jewish person in the world. And my mom was progressive in her, in her way. And a young woman that I grew up around, a uh, Jewish girl had just married a Pacific Islander guy. And she brought them in to talk about what it was like for to be Jewish and to be in an interracial marriage. And my mother got fired from the synagogue for, for bringing that in. Yes, people complained and she lost her job. This was also, in, it was in the 70s. Okay. But she, sometimes people just do not want to feel like they have to look at something they don't want to look at. And they, and they think the righteous thing to do is to complain to the rabbi and get that lady fired because then someone else can clean it up. They don't have to deal with it. And to me, people of faith, the ones that have really inspired me in my life, walk the walk. Okay. When I was on tour, uh, with the Broadway show that I was uh, on, there was a young woman. She was our leading lady. She, it was her first really big job. She was a beautiful, talented young woman in a very important role. And she came from a very religious family, very Christian family. And I came to find out that in every city that we went to with our show, she had ahead of time found a hospital or a soup kitchen or some place that she could be of service uh, because it was part of her life and she didn't tell anyone about it. She didn't announce it. I only found out about it by the by. She didn't call attention to it. She just went and did it. And then she did her big Broadway leading lady role. And I thought, that's the way to do it. That's it. It's it's part of her being on this planet that she is of service uh, because it's part of what she believes. And I find that incredibly inspiring. And I don't know what that means for me, and I don't know what it would mean for you or anybody else. But um, just declaring something 
Anybody can say anything. And everyone knows it. That's one of the reasons these people are so angry. Because they know that most people are holding their nose. <laughs> you know, they know it. Most people are just going, okay, yeah, mm-hmm, pronouns. Because they don't want to get in trouble. And that's every bully ever. Don't you think every bully ever knows that you know that they're weak, they ain't got nothing except brute force. And they're deeply insecure because they know that there's got to be – most people, most people just are quiet and just trying to get on with it. They're not pushing back. I pushed back because I had a, a childhood full of trauma. I was beat up and, and ostracized and in my hometown for years and years until I had to leave high school early. It was bad. And when I feel that coming at me, my lived experience says, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, you do not get to beat up on me. No, 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 no. And I think at the end of the day, Melody, and I think you know this, you have to be true to what you know is right. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't know what that is for them. And they are, and they're, they, they're afraid to stand for something. I want to end with this. How can we preserve a sense of unity with people while asserting our beliefs and questioning these ideas? Mm. I think you got to pick your moment. I think it's just as intrusive to lead with your resistance to militant activism than it is to be militantly active. I think walking in the room with it is is not the way to go. I think the way to go is to create brave spaces, not safe spaces. Not everyone's going to feel comfortable. You know this. I joked about this when we talked about, you know, trans women identifying as lesbians being on dating sites, you know, and saying you're a tr you're a transphobe if you don't like penises. And to me, you know, you're not going to get invited to every party. Not every room is going to be hospitable to you. And my take on it has always been be more interested in other people. Be more be more about oh hey, hi, I'm Melody. Oh, oh yeah, nice to meet you. Da da da. People just want to be seen. And a lot of these young folk who are feeling this rush of like, maybe I can be different, maybe I can do that. They're deeply insecure. They're very worried about how people are perceiving them all the time. And my heart goes out to that because being different is hard and you're not going to give these people a sense of empowerment and help them to create their own lane in this world uh, by, by only seeing them and only acknowledging them in these ways because they're very narrow and they're very reductive. And my thing has always been the best way, because I've toured all over this country and I've sat at a diner table uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama or, you know, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, and I'm, I stand out even even if I'm not trying to stand out. And my way is, you know, I'm, I sat at the lunch counter or the breakfast counter. Hey, how are you doing this morning? Oh, good, good. You know, I did a show years ago in Vermont in a place called White River Junction, Vermont, which is a little bit more than it was then. But then it was like a whistle stop. It had like a hotel and a restaurant. And it was like in the middle of nowhere. And there was a theater. And every morning I would go to the local diner to have my breakfast and to write in my journal. And I kept to myself. I sat at the counter and people just kind of looked at me, you know, these kind of, you know, people who are working people and sort of suspicious. I mean, no one said a word to me. Nobody messed with me. But over time, I was there. So they were curious and they're like, hey, what's going on? What are you writing? You're writing something every day. What is that? Oh, I'm just, you know, writing down my thoughts and stuff. Oh, 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 what are you doing in town? By the time I left that gig and left that town, I was on a first name basis with people. Hey, how you doing, Jamie? Oh, yeah, good. Are you going to come see the show? Oh, I don't know. I don't like shows. I don't know. You know, it's like 
you have to be a citizen of the world. Don't you think? I do. And I think that being interested in other people and, you know, we've lost manners. We've lost courtesy. People want to get rid of Mr. and Ms. and ma'am and sir because they're gendered and all of that. But to me, I don't think it's a big mystery what it feels like when somebody is going, hello, who are you? Oh, really? Oh, great to meet you. Terrific. And I think what I learned was, because I'm so in my head, and I think a lot of us creative types who are outspoken are also very hard on ourselves, very self-critical, very questioning our choices, all of that. But at the same time, we can't help not speaking out. And there's always going to be, remember this, take this away from me, because I learned this from the kids in my last show. There's all this talk about making the most vulnerable people feel comfortable. You know what the best way is? To set an example. They want to be confident like you. They want to be talented and crafted and daring like you. And you don't have to pander to them. They don't want attention called to them. And what I've learned is they find you. Even if it's a private moment and they're like, hey, how's it going? Like, you have to always assume that no one's as confident as you are. No one's as outgoing or as daring or as bold as you are. That they are afraid and insecure and want to belong and they just want to belong. I don't know that getting people up in a circle and saying, let's all say our pronouns makes people feel like they belong. I, I, I think it's a, it's a very outdated notion, but I think everybody wants to be equal. Everybody wants to be equally welcome there. And in theater, my God, Melody, that's where all theater is the repository for all the weirdos and misfits and oddballs ever since time began. So I don't know why we're working so hard to be sensitive to that. You know, uh, when that, to me, that was, theater was my, my safe space, my whole childhood. It's where I went to be different and to express myself. So I think be an example. But at the same time, look, Jordan Peterson is a provocateur. Okay, I don't know how you feel about him. He's a savant. To me, he's sometimes he's like that guy on the street corner with a sandwich board that says the end of the world is coming. And, rah, you know, he's kind of weird that way. But I think it's disgraceful that he is losing his battle in Canada to keep his license in the psychiatric or whatever it is, the clinical psychology. There's a bureau or there's a panel or a group up there that is the official body. And he got a lot of trouble over what he called, you know, enforced speech. And he lost his case. And I think that that's so... When you think about, I don't want to invoke, you know, the worst of the worst fascist regimes, but the fact is, you had to say certain things. And if you were a Jew in Nuremberg in 1933, you wore that that yellow star. You did it. And it becomes kind of second nature. It becomes kind of reflexive. And I think when we get into that, we're in trouble. So you and I, I think it's possible to be with other people who, even ones who are virulently insistent on this stuff uh, and still hold your own values. And if you can't, then yeah, you have to fight back. I think anybody who is capable of, of doing what happened to me last summer where people I didn't even know were attacking me, piling on and being insulting and mean because they felt like I had it coming because of this. If you're capable of that and you, then you want me to respect you, I think not. How are you being in the world? How are you walking in the world? That's all I care about. What kind of a person are you? I don't care what you believe. I don't care about your faith. I really don't. But, you know, Judeo-Christian faith, if you say you're a person of faith and you're Christian or Jewish or whatever, and you treat people like that, there's one core golden rule. We all know what it is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
if you're capable of doing something to somebody else that you would never in a million years want to have happen to you, you're the problem. You're the problem. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think we have a responsibility to ourselves because movements end, regimes topple, uh, trends peter out. And we're already seeing it and you're already feeling this back like people are starting to get a little more bold about going, OK. Mm -mm. Um, but if you've been true to who you are throughout, I think no matter what happens, you can feel you can feel like you were true to yourself. I don't know how else to to put that. I wish I had a more articulate way to do that. But I just don't think that can fluctuate with the times because nobody else is responsible for you. You know, those people, if they make you say whatever you want, and if you get on bended knee and go, I'm white privilege, please forgive me and I will. Those people don't care about you. They don't care what happens to you. They don't. They're not answerable to you for that. In the moment, they get to feel righteous and feel like they got something over on you. But at the end of the day, if you do that for somebody knowing it's wrong, it's scary, but I don't know. Maybe it's because I've had nothing. <laughs> maybe it's because I've been impoverished and I've had no work and I've had to deal with some hardship that what are you going to take? <laughs> <laughs> and we're finding each other, Melody. This is the thing that I've noticed. The conversations are happening more and more. You know? Yeah, I agree. Um, we found each other. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Jamie, I think... Thank God. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think it's a really good place to end. Um, yeah. I think I think yeah. it is yeah, yeah. really encouraging. It, it's uh, to be continued. To be continued. Round three. Keep up, keep the faith, keep talking, keep asking questions. You're doing everything you need to be doing and you know it, you know it. And I love you for it. And thank you for your encouragement, you know, and I will just keep, I don't want to keep fighting. I want to keep affirming the things that I think we all share as humans and, and that we need from each other. All right. Thank you, Jamie Beeman. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Always a pleasure.